Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're in a series that we're calling Jesus is Enough, and we're preaching through the book of Colossians, Pastor Tom and I. Um, let me remind you that I'm not the pastor here. Tom McCullough is our pastor, and we should love him and serve him and be under his authorities. He preaches from God's Word because that's the man who God has given us to be our pastor for the next year and a half. So I'm going to serve him, and I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to treat him as your pastor and do not treat me that way. Okay? I'm not your pastor yet. I will be, Lord willing. I want to be. Looking forward to it. And I hope you're not dreading it. But it hasn't happened yet. So don't look to me to lead you. Tom is our leader. Okay? I want to say that while he's not here. Don't tell him I said that. And if he starts watching that YouTube video, just delete it or something. I don't know. Okay, our text today is Colossians 1, 21 through 23. It's on page 983 if you're using your pew Bibles. If you're a guest of ours today, we're happy to have you with us. Um, take one of those pew Bibles with you, as I said earlier. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Let's read our text today. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the Gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." The Word of the Lord. I want to teach you a new word today, right? a little vocab lesson, and it's a German word. Okay, I'm going to try to pronounce it, and I want you to try to pronounce it back to me. Now, German words have like a whole lot of going on, you know, like you're trying to hock a loogie or something. So this one's one of those words. So I'm going to try to say it, and you try to say it back to me. It's called Zenzoch. Zenzoch. Okay? So at the end of it, you try to act like you're about to spit, right? Zenzoch. Try to say it with me. Ready? Zinzoch. Now that is a German word that means it's a practically indescribable longing or craving or yearning. It's this longing or yearning for something that we just can't really get our hands on. And we don't really know exactly what it is. Zinzoch. Right? And we all have these yearnings as people. All people everywhere. We have these yearnings for, I think it's called glory. We have these yearnings for something beyond us, something bigger, something fulfilling, something satisfying that we just can't really get our hands on, right? C.S. Lewis uh, called this, he said, we cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. So we all have this yearning for glory, and this desire is why people love the Grand Canyon. Right? You, why do people love to go to the Grand Canyon? Because it's incredible. And we have this desire for something that's glorious. Right? It's why we prefer the seven layer triple chocolate cake instead of just the measly old one layer triple chocolate cake. Right? It's why the two carat diamond is more appealing to us ladies than the one carat. Don't lie. Don't even, don't even, don't even act like you don't like the two carat better than the one carat. Zenzok, this desire for glory, this something that's beyond us, right? Uh, oh, guys, guys who love basketball. This is why we love to see the 360 degree dunk jumping over some guy instead of the warm up layup, right? It's this desire for glory. This, you want to see these incredible things. And Paul David Tripp calls us glory junkies. Paul David Tripp calls us, and he, and he points out that this, this desire that we have, this zenzoch, it's unique to people. It doesn't happen in animals. For example, he says, penguins don't judge themselves when they jump off the ice into the icy water. You don't see penguins doing that, right? Like we do that, you know what I'm saying? Penguins don't do that because they don't have this desire for something more and they don't judge one another to see who's jumping the best or something like that. But humans do that for whatever reason, right? Um, it's unique to us. We can see that there's something unique about us, about all people everywhere, that longs for something more. See, we have these longings, 
but there's something about our experiences that doesn't entirely satisfy. Like when you have a good meal. I love to eat good food. And the taste is incredible, and the texture is not grossing you out, um, and it's fulfilling, and it's satisfying, and you're full at the end of it, right? And you're just like, yes, and you undo your belt, right, at the end of Thanksgiving. What are you guys' problem? You know you do that, especially guys. You eat too much, and then you're just satisfied. Now I can watch football and just enjoy life, right? But what happens like three hours later? You get hungry again. There's just this desire for something to, be, to satisfy us, and these things kind of do, but they kind of don't, right? Look, 2010, Kobe Bryant. Raise your hand if you know who Kobe Bryant is. 2010, Kobe Bryant, the star of the Los Angeles Lakers, NBA star. They had just won the Thumbs down. Boo, Lakers. Um, they had just won the championship in 2010. And they were interviewing Kobe Bryant, who's the leader and the star of their team. And they were, they were like getting his thoughts about it, whatever. This is like 10 minutes after they just won the NBA championship. And Kobe Bryant said, I just can't wait to get back out there and win another one next year. And I was like, what? For all the work he did in the offseason, all the work he did throughout the season, all the weightlifting, all the video that they watched, and the satisfaction lasted 10 minutes? Really? Now, I, I shouldn't be too hard on Kobe because I do the same thing whenever I play softball. I love slow pitch softball. And we could beat somebody like 23 to 2. Or so we could just drill them. And then at the end of the game, I'm like, I can't wait, get, can't wait to get back out there. I wish we could have had 27 runs instead of 22, right? Where does that come from? And don't act like you're not like this too, okay? Let's just, let's just agree we're all in this together. This is why whenever you... Um, whenever you beat your mom in words with friends on your phone, you just have to rematch her because you just can't get enough of beating your mom in words with friends, right? Or um, when you get your job promotion and you get a raise, a pay raise, that satisfaction lasts about a week maybe, and then there's another rung of the ladder that you've got to get up to, and somehow you've got to get to that point too, right? Uh, we have this longing for something, for something glorious that we can kind of taste, but that we can never really get fulfilled. Zen Zoch. Where does it come from? How can we get it? What's our role in obtaining it? I would like to suggest that this desire comes because we're made in God's image. Because God has made us and we're broken. That's where it comes from and that's why the things don't fully satisfy. We're made in His image, but broken. Our text today is Jesus. Jesus sent a, this man named Paul to play a very important role in the spread of the good news in the church of Colossae. The churches there were being pulled away from the good news. They were being tempted to not believe in Jesus anymore, to turn away from Him and believe in some kind of other religion. And starting in verse 15, uh, as Pastor Tom preached two weeks ago, Paul goes on this beautiful hymn where he describes Jesus and who He is and the glory that is due His name. He's the image of the invisible God. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus. And Jesus will reconcile all things to Himself. And Jesus has made everything. And He is the reason everything exists. Right? And then he elaborates a bit on this reconciliation idea. Jesus will reconcile all things to Himself. It says there in verse 20, and now he's going to move beyond that and he's going to talk about how this reconciliation impacts you and I. How this reconciliation impacts everybody. And this reconciliation, this reuniting with God, this being friends with God again, this is the answer to our sin. So, let's look at our text today. Our text answers three questions. Three questions related to this. Three questions that we need to consider. The first question, why do we need reconciliation? The second, how does Jesus fix it? And the third, what is our responsibility? So if you're taking notes, there's my three points right there. The first question, why do we need reconciliation? Read verse 21 with me. Follow along as I read. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... 
So here Paul just lists three things, right? Three things that describe people apart from Jesus Christ. Alienated, hostile in mind, and doing evil deeds. Right? Very clear in the text. Alienated, we're separated from God. We're, we're distanced from Him. We, are, we do not have a right relationship with Him. We are not friends with God. Not only that, but we are hostile in mind. This, in the Old Testament, they would use the word heart for this. Uh, instead of mind, they would use the word heart. So it's like this idea that our mindset toward God is one of an enemy. The way that we think about God, the way that we thought about God before we were Christians, and the way that non-Christians think about God is that of an enemy. Hostile in mind with enmity toward God with their thoughts and their manner of life. And not only that, but they do evil deeds, right? Their actions follow up their mindset. Deeds that do not glorify God and do not please Him. Here is the picture of people apart from Jesus Christ, separated from God, distanced from Him, not fulfilled in life, enemies of God in their minds, and doing evil deeds to back it up. You see, we actually, people actually have a history of this. We have a history of this kind of situation. Back in Genesis 1 and 2, um, it actually wasn't like this then, right? When God made the world, He created Adam and Eve and created everything. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden. They talked with Him, and there was nothing wrong between their relationship and Him. There was complete fulfillment in life. There, I don't even think there would be a sin zolch for them. Because sin wasn't in the world. There was a perfect relationship between each other and they're not bickering and fighting with one another because it hadn't happened yet, right? And life is completely fulfilling and satisfying in the garden just like God intended it to be. This perfect unity between people and God. But then sin happened, right? Adam and Eve chose to reject God's command and God said, do not eat of this tree. And Adam and Eve said, we want to do that. They, they listened to the serpent, Satan, who tempted them, right? And they ate of the tree and they disobeyed God. And God cursed them. A couple things happened in this curse. One thing that happened is that there is now a brokenness between their relationship and God. Remember, Adam and Eve, before sin, they walked around naked because they were unashamed. They had nothing to hide between each other and God. After they sinned, what did they do? They hid from God. They heard Him walking and they said, I don't know. I better hide myself. There's something that's different about Him and there's something that's not right about us. They hid themselves from God. Not only that, but there was uh, issues between one another, right? Adam... Uh, used to work in a way that wasn't, didn't make him sweat, for example. It was like wonderful. Work wasn't strenuous and painful and toilsome. And because of the curse, now the ground brings up thorns and weeds and his work is totally distorted. Still required to do it, still called to do it, but it's messed up. And for Eve, pain and childbearing. You ladies are like, oh, why couldn't I have been a guy? <laughs> well, I understand that. Pain and childbearing for women now. And there's a relational thing that's broken. The text says that, Eve, you will desire to be over your husband, but he will rule over you. They'll have this desire to rule over their husband, whatever that means. But God has now appointed it to Adam. And so now they are required to live in submission to his leadership. But she wants to be a leader, so they butt heads. And there's conflict. Right? All because of the fall all because of the curse. Not only that, but the, the Scripture states in Romans, Adam's children started sinning. It passed on. And then their children started sinning. And then their children were sinning. And then their children, and 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 their children all the way down to you and I. That's where it came from. We are born with a bent towards sin. It's in our nature. It's in our hearts. It's what we're made to do in a way. We are like the Ford car with the logo on the emblem from the factory, but with defects. 
made in God's image, stamped with His image on us, right? But defective. Not functioning according to manufacturer qualifications. You and I. This is what's happened. We are alienated from God apart from Christ. Separated from Him. And now the world doesn't make sense. We seek things other than God to fulfill these longings that we have. And we worship the creation instead of the Creator. Like it says in Romans chapter 1. And our minds are hostile to God and our deeds are evil against God. This is why we need reconciliation. We need to be reunited. There's the first question. Why do we need it? Second question. What does Jesus have to do with it? Second question. What does Jesus have to do with this reconciliation? Look at me. Look with me. Not look at me. That's weird. Look with me. Verses 21 and 22. Let's read them again. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Here, verse 22 tells us how Jesus reconciled us and why this reconciliation is effective. How does Jesus reconcile us? It says it very clearly right there in verse 22. He has reconciled you in His body of flesh by His what? Death. He has reconciled us by His death. Why did Jesus die? Did Jesus die only because of Jewish oppression? Because the Jews couldn't stand that they were losing their kingdom? Did He die because the Romans were in charge? Why did Jesus die? Jesus died for our sins. The Bible is full of this. Look at this. Romans 5 verse 6. Christ died for the ungodly. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Galatians 1.4, Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins. Now here's something that's really interesting about this. There were other Jewish scholars who wrote about reconciliation, this reuniting of people so that friendship now exists again. Other Jewish scholars wrote about that. Josephus is one of them, a Jewish historian who lived back in, in that day, in the day of Paul. There are other books that are uh, in what we call the Apocrypha that our church is not considered to be part of Scripture, like in 2 Maccabees. Um, where reconciliation happens, but it only happens by the people who have been offended. I'm sorry, let me just take that back. The people who have done the offense, let's say I do something to Diane, and there's something broken in our relationship. I want to reconcile us. The person who did the offense initiates it in all other Jewish texts. But in this text, this is the first instance where the person who was offended initiates the reconciliation. God is the initiator of it. We do not come to God and start things. God reaches out to us by His grace and He sends Christ. And He's the initiator of this reconciliation. Christ died for our sins. What does Jesus have to do with it? His death reconciles us. But why is this reconciliation effective? Look at what it says in verse 22. He has reconciled us in His body of flesh by His death. For what reason? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Holy, blameless, above reproach before Him. Now the Jews in the Old Testament, before Christ came, back up with me a couple thousand years, um, they would offer sacrifices. You guys remember this in your Old Testament? If you don't remember it, that's okay. Um, they would offer sacrifices looking forward to another sacrifice that would cleanse them of their sin. Because it says in Hebrews that the blood of goats and bulls could never take away sin. So they did these sacrifices uh, in obedience to God, but also looking forward to something that would happen. And when they would bring an animal to the priest to sacrifice it, it would have to be perfect. There could be no issues with it. It couldn't have any physical defects. It couldn't be spotted, for example. It had to be pure. It had to be perfect. It had to be without blemish. And here, in verse 22, this is pointing back to that. This is pointing back to that and saying, because of Jesus' death in His body of flesh on the cross, now those of us who have put our faith in Him are presented to God just like that pure sacrifice would be. Holy. Spotless. 
without blemish, without blame. That's the way we're presented to God to reconcile us to Him. All because of what Jesus has done. When you put your faith and confidence in Jesus Christ to save you, when you believe what He said, that He died for your sins, then He makes you holy. God gives you the holiness of His Son on account of what Jesus has done. That's why reconciliation is effective. Because when God looks at us, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? We stand condemned as sinners. We know that we're unholy. We know that we're spotted. We know that we're blemished. That we're tainted. That we're bent away from Him. But we're presented, reconciled to God as holy and blameless and above reproach because of what Jesus has done. That's why reconciliation is effective. And that's what Jesus has to do with it. Now I want you to notice something here. This, this reconciliation, this reuniting with God, it is complete, and it's also not complete. It has happened, but it has not yet finally happened. Here's what I mean by that. It clearly says in verse 22, look at this with me, He has now reconciled in His body. So it's something that has happened. But the purpose of it is to present us before God as holy and blameless and above reproach. That part has happened, but it has not yet happened. Why? Because we're we have not stood before the judgment seat of God yet. We're still alive. There's still more life to live. Right? That part has not happened. It doesn't mean that you're like partly saved now and you'll be like... like 25% of you is a Christian now. You know, you're all Christian if you put your faith in Christ right now. But that will be finished. Let me put it this way. Raise your hand if you would say, if you would say this. You would say, um, my only confidence before God is because of what Jesus Christ has done on my behalf. Raise your hand if you would believe that. My only confidence before God is based upon what Jesus Christ has done. That's basically what it means to be a Christian. You put your faith and trust in Jesus to do what you cannot do, making you holy, right? So you do that now, and God sees you as righteous. He calls you righteous, and you're justified before God, right? But next week, you say the same thing. You're still justified before God. And when we stand before God, the judgment seat of Christ, we will not say something different than what we say right now will still say, my only confidence before you, God, is Jesus Christ and what He's done. That part hasn't happened yet. But we are still reconciled to God now. Does that make sense? I'm getting a couple of nods. I want to be clear on this. Look at Ephesians. Don't look at it. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. We were sealed. When we trust in Christ, we're given the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And that is like the down payment for what we will receive one day. Jesus Christ by His Spirit. And so we have this satisfaction in a way that non-believers don't have. We look at the world differently. We know who created it. And we know that there's something coming more. But even in that, there's still brokenness. And we, because we know that we still sin, right? And there's still sometimes barriers in like relational aspects between us and other people and us and God. And we confess our sin. But we have this confidence because the Holy Spirit is our down payment. I want to keep going. So, why do we need reconciliation? Because we were alienated from God. We were separated from Him because of our sin. What does Jesus have to do with it? Jesus reconciles us to God by His death. And He will one day finally reconcile all of us to God who have put our faith and confidence and who continue. Now, here's the rub. And here's the part I'm a little nervous about. What is our responsibility until that happens. Right? We are reconciled to God now. Those of you who have put your faith in Christ, 
you love Him, you serve Him, you believe in Him, you are right with God, what is our responsibility between now and that day when we stand before God and, Lord willing, we will be finally reconciled to Him? I think it says it very clearly in verse 23. Look at verse 23 with me. If you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This text presents a condition for this to happen. A condition that we have to meet in order for final reconciliation to happen. And the condition is not works. We do not become a Christian by works. You do not become a Christian by um, going to church. You do not become a Christian by being baptized as a baby. You do not become a Christian by giving your money to church. You do not become a Christian by serving your neighbor. You do not become a Christian by filling out a guest card that gives $5 to the South Oakland shelter. You do not become a Christian in any of those kinds of ways. You become a Christian by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ to do what you cannot do, and you continue to be a Christian by faith. See, the condition for final reconciliation with God is the same condition for becoming a Christian. Faith in Jesus Christ. Look. Hmm. What does the hymn say? You know that famous hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. Look, look, listen to the last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. See, even our standing before God on that day is still Jesus Christ. And you must continue to believe. That is the clear application that Paul is trying to make to his readers. You must continue to believe the gospel. You must continue. You must not shift from the hope that was laid out to you in the gospel. Other scriptures say the same thing. In Romans 1, Paul said that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. This is a righteousness that begins and ends by faith. We become righteous before God by faith in Jesus Christ, and we continue to be righteous before God by faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 11, Paul, referring to the Gentiles that God has grafted into His fellowship, said that we must continue in His kindness. Acts 13 Paul and Barnabas shared the good news in a synagogue and many people were converted. And then before they left, it says that Paul and Barnabas urged them to continue in the grace of God. You must continue. A.W. Tozer said this, Faith is not a once done act, but a continuous gaze at the heart of the triune God. A continuous gaze. And you must keep gazing on Christ if you will see final reconciliation. Okay. Now, there's, there's a particular application here. And I want to give you a little bit of theology background, okay? I, uh, I, was, I, I am studying at uh, a conservative seminary in Louisville who teach something different than our church holds to. Um, it's a Southern Baptist church. There are some of you, I'm sure, who believe that it's not possible for a Christian to forfeit your salvation. Some of you probably believe that. I don't ask you to raise your hand. Um, and I want to say that you can be a member here and believe that. That is a secondary issue. And I really don't have a problem with you being, being a member here. The only problem I would say that you probably shouldn't teach a class about that. That's probably the only issue I would ever have with that. And there are some of you that believe more uh, of what most free will Baptists believe in that salvation is something that you can forfeit as a Christian. Um, and you can be a good Christian and love Jesus Christ and believe either one of those. You really can. Um, but there's a particular danger when we come to these kind of texts for both views. I want to talk about the danger 
for those of you that hold the view that are more, that more free old Baptists hold, the particular danger for those of you that think that we can forfeit our salvation at some point is that how do you ever really know that you're a Christian? How can you know? I want to say to you today that you don't lose your salvation like you lose a set of keys. Right? I lose my keys all the time. And I don't intend to lose my keys. It just happens. You know, I set them down and then I go do something and then I just forget where they were. It's not like I, I want, yes, I'm going to lose my keys today. Right? No, you don't. That's not what, the Bible does not teach anything like that. Absolutely not. Also, notice that the condition here for continuing in, in Christ is faith, not works. Getting mad at your spouse does not no longer make you a Christian. Thank the Lord, right? Getting angry in traffic does not forfeit your salvation. Wanting to look at porn does not make you forfeit your salvation. It doesn't. Uh, relational struggles that we have doesn't. Any kind of that kind of sin is not going to make you forfeit your salvation. Because what happens when Christians sin? Christians sin, but they're a unique kind of sinners. They're repenting sinners, right? What happens when a Christian sins? And the Lord shows us that we have sinned. He convicts us. And we say, God, I'm sorry. But thank you for Christ. I am still clinging to Him. He is still my only hope. And that's what we do as Christians. So don't think that you can't know that you're a Christian if you hold this position. You can know that you're a Christian. You, Jesus is holding you and you want Him to hold you and you cling to Him as your only hope even though you know you're a sinner. Friend, you're a Christian. That's a Christian. Now if you kick Jesus in the teeth and say, leave me alone. I want nothing else to do with you. That's different than getting mad at your wife. That's unbelief. That's rejecting Christ. That's very different. Do not let Satan convince you that you're not a Christian when you really are. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you cling to Him as your only hope before God? And friend, you're a Christian. Rest in Him. Rest in God. Yes, obey Him, love Him, serve Him. You want to do that, but not because you're trying to earn something, but because God has loved you. Right? It's a heart of gratitude. There is a particular danger for those of you that hold that view. There's another danger for those of you that hold the other view. The view that, that you can not forfeit your salvation. See, the danger for that kind of view is this. You can come to passages like this in verse 23 where it clearly says, if you continue. If you do not shift from the hope of the gospel. And then you can just take the teeth right out of those. Because you say, well, I could never lose my salvation. I prayed a prayer when I was five. And I know that I can never lose it. So I know that I'm going to continue. And then you ignore the clear warnings. This book is filled with warnings. This whole book of Colossians was written because people were tempted to move away from Christ. The book of Galatians was written for that. Hebrews was written for that reason. Do not allow your theological position to usurp the clear teachings of Scripture. Do not allow that to happen. There are clear warnings. You must continue to cling to Jesus Christ if you will be saved. You must continue. Do not shift from the hope of the Gospel. This is what Paul is saying. That is his application in these texts. That's what he's telling his people. So that's why I have to tell it to you. Do not shift from the hope of the gospel. I prayed a prayer when I was five. I was baptized when I was a baby. Friend, we don't call that baptism. Baptism is something that believers do. To identify themselves with God. It doesn't earn you favor at all. I prayed a prayer when I was five years old. I came forward at church camp. Is there any affection in your heart for Jesus Christ? Do you cling to Jesus Christ as your only hope? 
Do some of you, you have no affection for Christ at all. You could give a rip about who He is and what He's done. But because you prayed a prayer when you were five, you think you're good, friend. Unless you continue in the hope of the Gospel, you will not be saved. You must continue. Jesus is your only hope. Will you cling to Him? Keep clinging to Him. Keep holding on to the hope laid out for you in the Gospel. Am I clear? See, if you're not a Christian today, I want you to just be, be honest with yourself. And ask God to reveal Himself to you. Maybe, you, maybe you're wondering, even, is there even a God? I don't even know. Well, I want to just suggest that it's not going to hurt if He's not there and you talk to Him. Right? So just go ahead and give it a shot. Ask Him. Talk to Him and see if He will speak to you. I firmly believe that God has given us these desires for glory, for something bigger than us, because we're made in His image, but we're bent and we're broken. And the only way that we're going to find purpose in life now and to fulfill those longings forever is through Jesus Christ, who brings us to God by His death. And if you will put your faith and confidence in Christ and turn from your sin, then you will be saved. You will be saved. And if you're a Christian today, we experience this Zen Zucht still, right? We still experience it, even though we have glimpses, little pictures of the glory of God as the Spirit encourages us and as He grows us to be more like Jesus Christ. We experience that, but we still have these longings that are unfulfilled because we have not yet finally rested in God at the final reconciliation. Friend, continue. Continue to cling to the hope laid out for you in the Gospel. There will be a day when Jesus Christ, who ascended into heaven and is seated at God's right hand, will one day return to this earth and He will make a new heavens and a new earth on which only righteousness will dwell. The Eden that existed in Adam and Eve will be recreated. And we will be with God and we will talk to Him face to face. The dwelling place of God will be with men, it says in Revelation. And He will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more sin or sorrow or death or pain. And that sin that we feel will be no more. But we will see Jesus face to face. We will live with Him forever. If you continue to cling to the hope of the Gospel. Let's pray together. God, will you let your word just settle down into the crevices of our heart and melt away any pride or arrogance that we have toward you? Would you lay out the hope for us in the gospel in a very clear way, in a way that we can see it, in a way that's desirous, in a way that only you can do by your spirit? When you lay us bare before your word and vulnerable and broken, Father, I pray that you would do that. That you would encourage Christians here who are, they wonder if they've sinned their way out of your grace. Father, would you encourage them to continue to cling to Christ who has become sin for them? For people who aren't a Christian, maybe they didn't know they weren't a Christian until today. Lord, would you draw them to Christ? Help them to put their faith and confidence in Him and turn from their sin. And for those who maybe are falsely assured, would you encourage them, God, to continue to cling to the hope of the Gospel? To turn from their self-righteousness and to cling to the righteousness of another? God, would you do this? And God, would you empower us? We, we need you. I need you. I need to know that you're near to me, that you love me, that you have a purpose. My friends here need to know that too. 
We need to know that you have a purpose for our suffering, for struggles, for temptations. We need you to work in us and we need your word to become real to us. God, would you do that? Would you give us hearts that are willing to hear? Eyes that are open? And would you move in us again in a powerful way? Help us to respond now to you, God. Jesus, you are so glorious. You are the creator of the world and all things will be reconciled to you because you are incredible. You are the great God, the image of God. You created all things and you hold all things together. Jesus, I want to glorify you. We want to glorify you to lift up your name in this place, to send out this message of reconciliation to people who need to know you. Jesus, would you do this? Please. We love you. We want to love you better. We want to be your ambassadors. Help us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.